Let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you for this day that you blessed us with, that we can come into this place and worship you and sing praises to your name, to know of your great love for us and your grace for us. And Father, we love you because you've done so much for each and every one of us in this room. Father, I pray that today we can be used for your glory uh, somehow, that you would uh, move in our life as we move in the lives of others around us. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen. I want to share with you just a quick little story about uh, a secretary of mine that I had at one point in time. Her name was Linda Bentley. And uh, Linda Bentley, uh, her mom and dad were, were, were great people, loved her mom. Um, just the sweetest lady that, uh, that, I, that I've ever known. And uh, Linda's, Linda's um, uh, was my secretary for a lot of years. And uh, her father uh, came down with a debilitating disease called ALS. And uh, if you've known anybody that's had ALS, you know that it uh, just uh, attacks the muscles and it, it slowly deteriorates the inside of the body to the point where uh, you just can't function anymore and you end up passing away. I remember the time when Linda and I, we would go over and we would, I would sit with her dad and her mom and, and her and we would just talk you know, with her dad and everything. And um, we just saw, saw, slowly saw him progress uh, worse and worse and worse. Um, of course, you know, being the preacher, you know, I was like, you, you got to do my dad's funeral. And I'm like, yeah, I, I think I would be, you know. Um, and when it came time to, to do his funeral, I looked at Linda Bentley and her mother, and I saw within them some of the greatest strength that I've ever seen in people. Losing their father and their husband. Because their faith led them to being uh, thankful for the time they did have with, uh, with him. Uh, Linda would convey to me such things like, you know, um, uh, her childhood experiences with her dad and, and how she was blessed by having such a loving father. And, and um, I, I just remember her having this thankfulness to God even through the suffering and the pain her dad went through with ALS. Um, you obviously know what ALS is. It's a Lou Gehrig's disease called that. Well, a number of years ago, there was a commercial uh, on television that began with a black and white clip of Lou Gehrig being honored by the Yankee fans on his last day of, of playing. His career was shortened by ALS, which is now called the Lou Gehrig's disease. Again, this debilitating uh, disease, it was a muscle disease that eventually just stops the heart. It eventually gets to that point. What do you say in the face of this heartbreaking challenge that anyone goes through? Amazingly, Lou Gehrig says, today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. <laughs> How could he say that? How do you think a man like that going through the disease that he went through can say something like that? And you look and you think it's gratitude. It's gratitude, it's thankfulness, right? He had gratitude for all the gifts he had been given, for all the love that he had been shown by the fans, for all the uh, opportunities that he had because he focused on the joys, not the losses. You focus on the joys, not the losses. And that's cultivating Thanksgiving. And that's what I want to talk to you today about. Because I saw that in my secretary. I saw that in her mother. That they just cultivated thankfulness through all the blessings that they had, not the fact that they were losing uh, their loved one. And uh, looking at that strength, looking at that, um, that power of faith in them, um, Oftentimes we need to look at people who go through struggles like that and, and see their faith. It, and, it, and it encourages us. Being thankful doesn't come easy. 
does it? It, it? Sometimes it really doesn't. But God says, and God wants us to cultivate thankfulness. So how do you do that? How do you cultivate thankfulness? Well, you got to work hard at it. It's not something that comes easy. You dig in, you, you, you cut up, and you refine whatever you're cultivating, and you do whatever it takes to thrive in the situation that you are presently living in, uh, and, and you work through that. But it's hard. And gratitude just simply comes from humility because we got to humble ourselves within that situation uh, that we're in. A man by the name of Harry Beecher Ward said, A proud man is seldom a grateful man, for he never thinks he gets as much as he deserves. And that's, that's kind of the attitude that I, I know a lot of people have. They, they are, they're proud people, and uh, because they're proud, they, they never really understand the blessings that they get in their life. Now, let me ask you just this one question. Raise your hands if you've been blessed this week by God. Okay? you got to remember that blessing and cultivate that thanksgiving to Him. God is a great God, isn't He? He's a good God. He's a merciful God. Right? The price that Jesus paid for you and me, that price was enormous to redeem us. It was huge. And what Jesus has done for all of us, we've got to step back and go, God, thank you, thank you, thank you for what Jesus has done for me. You know, when we give freely in Jesus' name, the thankfulness of the recipients is given to God. Uh, it's not given to us. You know, when, when, when we look at the life that we live, it is not about us. It's about giving uh, thankfulness to God. I want to read a text from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Starting verse 10, Paul is writing to this congregation, and he begins to say to this congregation, Now... He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but also the overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God because of the service by which you have proved yourself. Others will praise God for the obedience that, accom that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will, be, uh, will go out to you because of the surpassing grace <coughs> that God has given to you. Thanks be to God for His indescribable <coughs> gift. Now, I want you to understand something that uh, the words that you're going to fill in uh, on, on your page come right out of this text. Okay, And it's a very simple outline, but it helps to cultivate that thanksgiving to God as you read through uh, this text and as you look at it and apply it to your life. And the first thing is this. God will increase the store of your seed. Okay? He's going to increase the store of your seed. God is going to enlarge the harvest of your own righteousness. And He's going to do that through His righteousness. And thirdly, God's going to enrich you in every way. Do you see the blessings in those things? Do you see how God's going to give to you uh, an increase and enlarge you in your righteousness and enrich you in every way? Isn't that a way that we should be living in thankfulness to God is because He's going to continually offer His gift to you daily. Daily. And the result comes right out of Scripture because the result is this. Generosity will come on every occasion. 
you're going to be thankful in everything that you do and say and how you live and the actions. Everything will come from you is a generosity to God, to, as a thankfulness to Him. And you begin to cultivate that in your life. Generosity will result in thanksgiving. See? And it's obedience along with the confession. Because when you obey and you confess, you're turning the focus off of you and what you have to what God has and what God has given you. And so you bless Him and thank Him for those things. But the process goes like this. If you serve, you will supply. If you prove yourself through obedience and confession and sharing, others will praise God. That's the process. You, you serve one another and you supply uh, those uh, blessings to others so that they in turn, through your obedience and through your confession and through your sharing of God's blessings to other people, then they can turn around and they're going to give praise to God. They're not going to praise you. They're going to praise the one who gave those gifts to you. You're, they're going to praise the one who offered all those things to you. And all this is based on how you respond to the verses that come prior to verse 10. In chapter uh, 9, starting verse 6, we read these words. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. So sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you're going to reap generously. God calls for cheerful giving, not reluctant, compulsive giving. God loves and blesses the giver, a cheerful giver, and He does so abundantly. Now let me ask you, have you been abundantly blessed this past week? Anybody? He desires for you to have every need fulfilled. And He desires for us to abound in this service that we accomplish for His people. That we abound in thankfulness to Him because of the blessings. President Abraham Lincoln once made this proclamation. And this is, you know, obviously a long time ago. He says, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers and wealth and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we've forgotten God. Now, this is Abraham Lincoln. This is that long ago, he says, but we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all the blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, he says, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God who made us. Wow! It's almost as if Abraham Lincoln is speaking of our nation today, is he not? Yes. So what does that tell you? We've not changed. And if anything, we're worse. Because that's exactly how our country is right now. It's not thankful for the many blessings that God has bestowed on this nation. 
and its people. Oh yes, there are some thankfulness going on. There are some people who will, will recognize God's hand in our nation and, and God's hand in, our, in the blessings that we've received and the strength and the power and the grace that we receive. But it's become fewer and fewer and fewer, hasn't it? Luke 17 tells us an account of Jesus. As he's walking along, he, ten men come up to him and, and they're, they got this debilitating disease called leprosy. Uh, if you had leprosy in their day, uh, when you see somebody coming, you have to say, unclean, unclean. You have to stay away from your families. You can't go home. You can't hug your wife or your, 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 your husband or your children or your family. You can't do anything because of this debilitating disease. Could you imagine uh, having one go through that disease, but two, be the family member who can't touch their loved one, who can't sit by their side while they're going through this terrible disease. But these ten men who had leprosy, they stood at a distance. They called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And Jesus told them to go and show themselves to the priest. And as they went to go show themselves, they were healed immediately. And so Luke tells us that one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. See, so just a moment ago, he was yelling out in a loud voice saying, Jesus, have pity on us! I can imagine running back going, God, save me! God, heal me! Right? Isn't that the way you see that and picture that? God has healed you. But what happened to the gratitude of everyone? Jesus took a moment to ask. He says, we're, we're not all ten cleansed. Did I make a mistake? You know, did I leave the other nine out? You know, were there, where are the other nine? He says, has no one returned to praise God except, I love this, except this foreigner? He was a foreigner. And he came back. So where's the gratitude? If you're healed, if you, were, if you were healed from a debilitating disease, would you not return to God and praise Him? Would it not burn in your, in your soul to thank God? I mean, what an abundant, bountiful gift from God. But I want to tell you, you have been healed. You and I, we've all been healed. If we've given our life to Jesus, we've been healed by the worst disease that we could ever, ever have. And that is a disease called sin. And God has cleansed us of that sin. And He does it every day because you know what? You and I sin every day. And yes, we can be thankful for the material blessings of, uh, uh, of clothing and house and car and food and all those things, a place to to be sheltered in. But you know what? Those materials, uh, possessions, are all going to be destroyed one day. It's not going to matter. It really is not going to matter. And where will your life be then? We can lose it all. I think we need to thank God for the very one blessing that He's given to us, and that is His blood covered our sin and washed it away. Mark tells us the story of a young man, a rich young ruler who came to Jesus. He's wanting to know about eternal life and Jesus instructs him to, set, uh, to sell all that he had and, and give it to the poor. And if you know anything about this story, the rich young ruler looked at Jesus and said, I can't do that. And uh, Jesus said, you know, basically if you don't give everything away, uh, you're not going to have eternal life. You're not going to understand what eternal life is all about. And uh, so he goes away, he leaves he, he, with his head down. He goes away sad because he had a lot of riches. You know, it's hard for rich people to get into the kingdom of God. It's not impossible, it's just hard. And, and, and he was not blessing God for the things that he had. I mean, do you, do you, I think this. I think that God, if he would have taken all of his things and sold them and gave it to the poor... 
I think God would have blessed him far greater than he would ever have even had in the first place. Don't you? Amen. That's the way God works. And see, what he, won, what he wanted from this young man was simply obedience to say, okay, I'll do it. Did Jesus really want him to sell everything and give it to the poor? Or was he just wanting to hear that obedience from this young man? I, I don't know. But he wasn't very thankful for the things that he had. If Jesus said to you, I want you to sell your house, I want you to sell your car, I want you to sell all your possessions right now, today, give it all to the poor, What did you just think of first? Where will I live? Yeah. <laughs> what will I drive? How will I get home? Stuff here in church building. <laughs> with the back, yeah, with me. <laughs> yeah, that, that, you're not gonna like that. But what if that happened? I mean, what if you just heard this audible voice? From God who says, I want you to sell everything you got right now, right today, and I want you to give it to the poor. How would you think? Man, I, I, I don't know if I could do that. I would have, I've got this and this and that. Matthew tells us an account where 5,000 men plus women and children, okay? We, we tend to forget, we think, oh, the feeding of the 5,000. Right? But it's 5,000 men plus women and children. So it could have been triple that. Okay? Just, just to get out of your head. Could have tripled that. And Jesus tells the disciples, I want you to feed them. And they're like, well, we don't need food. Tell them to go, go to the store and buy it. And he says, no, you feed them. Okay? They had nothing. And they found only a small boy's lunch of five loaves of bread and two fish. That's not going to go very far for thousands of people. But Jesus took those items. And all it says is that he looked up to God and he thanked God and then said, okay, go feed them. What do you think happened? The bread started multiplying and the fish started multiplying. And they probably started their little fire so they can cook their feed, fish unless they like sushi, which is raw fish, and that would not be me. Um, you know, and, and they, they start breaking the bread, and they break the fish, and they, they're starting to eat, and thousands, thousands are being fed, right? And then it says that there were some leftovers. It's kind of like Thanksgiving, isn't it? There's always leftovers. Twelve baskets full of bread and fish. Twelve baskets out of thousands of people that were fed. And all Jesus said was, thank you. And he broke the bread and he handed it out. God provides such a bounty that we cannot contain it. We can't contain it. Every person was filled and there was so much left over. It, when you got when you when you have your Thanksgiving dinner this week, some of you, uh, I know John and Nancy had their whole family. I think how many did you have? Thirty. Thirty-five. Thirty-five people. Do you have leftovers? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. God, I mean, he just blesses us, and when we go uh, and grip so tightly onto our possessions, we don't give thanks for all that God has done in our life. We begin to block the Holy Spirit from moving in our life, from moving in those life situations, from moving in those debilitating diseases, moving through those pains and sufferings and the other things that we go through. And we tend to have this backwards because we'll, we'll say, thank you for uh, you know, giving me food and shelter, but do we thank God for letting us go through the pain and the suffering that we go through? Never. 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 There was a man by the name of uh, Jason Bradley. 
He had a sermon that was entitled The Link Between Generosity and Gratitude. And uh, I, I listen to sermons every now and again. I'll, I'll read through sermons. But I like this, what he said out of this, out of his sermon. He said this, Consumerism encourages us to acquire more and more for our happiness. Let me, let me ask you, are, are you really happy? Or do you want more? Are you happy with your salary? Are you happy with your, your car? How many of you are ready to buy a new car? How many of you need some new clothes? Because your old ones... Are we, are we happy with the things that we have? Yeah. And, and he says this, what we don't see is that when we trust him in this... Oh, wait a minute. Let me go back. He says, Jesus calls us to be countercultural and give our money away. Uh, and what we don't see is that when we trust him in that, he blesses us. That's like I said. If you were told to sell everything and give it, I think he's going to bless you more than you could even imagine. He says, we're not called to suffer through giving to others. It's just we don't, uh, we won't see the blessing until we learn to be obedient. And, and, and I agree with that. Because we won't learn any lessons until we're obedient. We won't understand anything until we're obedient. You know? Now, I, I'm not God's voice. <laughs> Somebody's beeping. I'm not God's voice, and I'm not going to tell you to go sell everything and give it to the poor. Okay? <laughs> Somebody's beeping. Here's, here's what I... Here's what I think. I, I know so many people who are so generous. I know so many people who are so generous. And they give, and they give, and they give. And you would think that they're the richest people in the world, but they're not. They give to others when they don't have a whole lot. Um... You know, many of them are very much like the widow with the widow's mite. You know, the, the person that comes to church and only gives, you know, like a couple pennies, and everybody else is, you know, digging in and like, man, I go out there grabbing that money in, so everybody sees what they give, and all she did. And Jesus says, you know what? You all gave out of your wealth. She gave out of her poverty. She gave all she had. She gave all she had. And Jesus looked at her and, and, and blessed her. Not the ones who gave out of their wealth. Because it's really, unless you gave all of your wealth. You know, there's a person that just won, what was it? Three point billion? Three? A billion? Three hundred, three hundred something, but I don't know what the number was. Okay? If you won that, would you turn around and write that check off and give it to the poor? Why not all of it? It wasn't yours in the first place. You didn't have it in the first place. Is that going to make a difference? To us, it will. We would use that money and we'd go buy the biggest house, the biggest car, the most expensive stuff, you know. And, and you might give somebody something of it, but here, you know, here's the thing. We would give out of our wealth, not out of our poverty. So when it comes to generosity, just look at what Paul wrote in this letter, okay. In verse 8, he says, uh, you need to abound. In verse 10, he says, God will increase and he'll enlarge. In verse 11, he says he'll enrich you. In verse 12, it says you need to be, have so overflowing. There's, there's this grace that's overflowing. And in verse 14, there's surpassing grace of God. And according uh, to this text, abounding in generosity naturally brings a response of thankfulness and thanksgiving. But you and I have to practice it. You and I have to cultivate that generosity and that thankfulness if we're truly going to learn the truth about what it really means to be a thankful people. God is increasingly generous to us. 
increasingly generous to us. So when you think about the messages this month, we, we need to have a heart of thanksgiving. We need to be thankful for who God is, and we need to cultivate that thanksgiving. Because God has given us, it says in the text, this indescribable gift of his surpassing grace. An indescribable gift of his surpassing, surpassing grace. Some call it God's riches at Christ's expense, right? You know, it's the acronym, God's riches. But I, 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 I'm not sure if that's good enough. That's enough. Because, you know, what are the riches? Well, then you can start naming all the riches, right? So I came up with an acronym myself. It's kind of lame, but it, here it is, okay? It's God's remission actually cancels evil. Because that's really what grace is about. 